Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome everybody to the March 2019 installment of the Sustainability Leadership Presentation Series. So thank you for joining us today. Um, today's presentation is hosted by the Hastings College Student Environmental Action Coalition. So a couple housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are in listen only mode to prevent any background noises, but you are invited to ask questions and can do so a few ways. So one is to put the questions directly into the WebEx chat box. If you hover over your screen, you should see a speech bubble icon that will open the chat feature. If you're in a live viewing room, um, you can give your questions to your room host and they will put them in the chat box. And lastly, you can ask questions through Twitter using the hashtag SLPS Thursday. Um, so I will turn it over to the Hastings College Student Environmental Action Coalition now. Hi, I'm Mary. I'm the president of SEEK, and today we have invited Nico and Ola to come present. Uh, to start off, Nico will be going. She has nearly 40 publications to her name. Uh, she has a background in birds and wildlife and has worked in the Americas, Africa, Madagascar, Europe, Middle East, and the tropical Pacific. Uh, she's worked before the Korean Trust at the Smithsonian Institute and Drexel University. And we are very glad that she's here and we'll hand it off to her. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, we're really excited to be here and to talk about how to measure environmental sustainability using several different approaches with both terrestrial and aquatic animals. So I just wanted to start by referencing the impetus for our work is the fact that we are living in an age of extinction. And unfortunately, it is human caused, but fortunately, because we are the cause, we can also solve a lot of the problems that we are causing. Uh, one of the examples is right here in the Hastings Museum. Uh, we have uh, one of the last individuals of the subspecies of Great Plains wolf, which is now extinct. And that's just one of many extinctions caused in the Americas and around the world by our burgeoning populations. So, so generally, when we think about human threats to biodiversity, there are five major ones, and we're going to touch on all of these today. Um, these are described in different different ways, but generally speaking, it's over exploitation, so over harvesting or killing too many of a population or um, a community habit causing habitat loss or change through degradation. Um, new nutrient loading and pollution, which can cause um, phenomena such as the algae bloom that's pictured here, alien invasive species where humans take species that are native to one part of the world and then bring them to another part of the world. An example is the lionfish pictured here. It's native to the Indo-Pacific and it's been put in the Atlantic and it becomes a super predator there um, and causes a lot of biodiversity loss. And finally, climate change. Um, which is the least understood, but possibly most important of all of the threats um, to biodiversity that we cause. And we will especially be seeing this in the coming decades as predicted by um, climate scientists. So the main question we want to address today is how do we know, there's a lot of talk about sustainability and this is sustainable and that is not sustainable, but how do we actually know? Well, our answer is uh, we measure it. <laughs> Um, and we're going to show you, um, we're just going to kind of dive in with a number of case studies. I think we have four case studies total to present to you um, and with different methods. And so um, the first one I wanted to talk about is measuring the sustainability of forest management, by which I mean logging. How can we take logs, trees out of a forest, use them for timber, but still have an intact, healthy forest ecosystem? And the way, uh, there are many, many ways to do this. Um, but the way I want to talk about, because I'm an ornithologist, is using birds. So birds um, make wonderful sentinels of biodiversity. They are more resilient than many other animals because they're able to move. Um, on the other hand, they're much easier to study than a lot of other animals. They're um, conspicuous um, both by uh, seeing them and by hearing them, and they're almost in every ecosystem in the world. So you can find them anywhere, and there are basic standard techniques you can use to sample them and measure um, the sustainability of, a, of, of an action. And the area that I want to talk about uh, for this particular case study is in West Africa. 
Um, it's a heavily human impacted ecosystem, and it also has very high endemism, so it's considered a biodiversity hotspot. Um, there are a high number of native species there that don't exist anywhere else. At the same time, there are very high heavy human impacts. There's been massive human population growth, and there's also a lot of industrial uh, activity, logging, um, agriculture, and other uh, other human activities. Um, chances are, if you like chocolate, chances are if you buy a chocolate bar, bar that it actually comes from West Africa. A huge proportion of the world's chocolate is produced in West Africa, and unfortunately, this is a major driver of deforestation of rainforests because it's uh, very lucrative for uh, people to cut down rainforests and plant um, the tree that produces chocolate. Um, and so, I, um, as a right after I finished my PhD, for two years I was based in Ghana, where we did studies on the forests that remain. This is a satellite image of intact uh, of the intact forest. This was once an entirely forested ecosystem um, during the British colonial. Um, period, they decided uh, deliberately to deforest most of it uh, for to make money in various ways um, through agricultural plantations. Um, they, however, wanted to protect about 20% of it. That's what remained um, after Ghana became independent. And the reason for that was environmental sustainability. They wanted to, the standing forest to prevent erosion and a lot of the problems you see when you completely denude an, an ecosystem. Um, so we worked, uh, there's not time to really go into detail because we have so much we want to cover today, but um, we worked in a number of these forests um, with, of, uh, that you can see that are shown on the map. Um, a scientist that we collaborated with, Lars Holbeck at the University of Ghana, had sampled a lot of these areas um, 15 years before we did, and that gave us the opportunity to, sh to compare his data with our data and see how things had changed over time. And this is, we used a technique called mist netting. Um, that uh, Mary here has uh, experienced um, in, in great uh, intensity. And um, it's a standard technique that's used all over the world by scientists. And basically you can use the same technique in different areas and see uh, and sample the bird community. So you can compare bird communities in different areas and look at um, the responses to different impacts. And this is just a sample of some of the birds that we caught in Ghana. And so, um, I just want to um, present uh, very briefly our results. In 1995, the scientist that I mentioned earlier, Lars Holbeck, collected data, and we compared that data with data we collected in 2010. And we compared four different forest types. So our, the unlocked forest was our point of reference. So all of these studies of sustainability, we use a natural ecosystem, the most natural ecosystem we can find as a reference point or a control. And then we compared uh, that reference point with forests that have been logged two years earlier, 10 years earlier, and 20 and more years earlier. What we found is that in 1995, the logging did appear to be sustainable. The bird community did not decline after logging, it actually increased. Um, that's typical because when you open up forest, it can stimulate more plant growth. Um, this is to a, to a minor degree, not when you clear cut forest necessarily, but when you cut uh, within a forest, you can stimulate growth and that can stimulate uh, birds to come in. Um, this is a bird specific response. However, if you look at the uh, gray bars, you can see that it does not increase after logging. It actually decreases and stays down. So why would this be? The laws in Ghana didn't change in that time. The practices on paper didn't change. What changed? Um, I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Uh, what changed, we believe, is illegal logging. It, um, the population of Ghana has exploded in the last few decades. Law enforcement when it comes to forestry and wildlife is extremely weak. These are agencies that are very poorly funded. It's very different than the United States where you go to the national park and there's a whole infrastructure. A lot of national parks in, in Ghana you can go to and there's just nobody there. So you want to go in and cut down some trees? You can, you can, you can try it and see if anyone's going to stop you and probably nobody will because we saw it every day we were in the forest. Um, so other studies have shown that between 1995 when the original study was done in 2010 when we did our study, logging intensities increased 600 percent, even though on paper they didn't change at all. So to me, this is a, an example of how it's really important to go into the field and do work and not just look on the computer and the documents because there's a lot of differences between what's going on in the real world and what may appear to be going on on paper. Um, Forests are now being logged by many calculations at four times the maximum sustainable rate. In fact, this shows they're not just being logged, they're being forested. And this, these are just examples of illegal logging that we saw where people just come in 
take a chainsaw and cut down trees and take them away. Um, so the main take home message, again, there's no time to go into great detail, but more than half of the birds in Ghana in the forest that were originally sampled in 1985 were had disappeared. Basically, they've lost more than half of their birds in just a 15 year period. Can you imagine if that were the case here? It's a massive change and it's not good. <laughs> so basically, um, individual birds, we had um, 54 different species. Some of them had declined by over 90 percent. Um, some of them did okay. A couple of them increased. A couple of them de uh, declined by about half, which was the background rate. So the point in showing this is just that a different species uh, respond in different ways, and Ola is going to talk about that also with aquatic invertebrates, different levels of sensitivity to disturbance. But um, the take home message is this is very bad news for biodiversity, and birds are just sentinels. A lot of other taxa would be doing worse because they can't move around and respond as freely as birds do. Um, but the good news is that we do know this is happening. By measuring it, we have a, a, an idea of how serious the problem is, or if nothing is wrong at all. In this case, we found a serious problem, and I just wanted to throw this in. Um, this is an example of how you can stop illegal logging in Ghana. It's that simple. You can take a, um, a caterpillar and dig a trench in a row that stops the cars from going in, and that's how they have to get those cars in to get the logs out. So this is an example. We were working with logging companies. This is a logging company doing that to protect the timber inside. So just an example, as bad of a, as a problem can seem, there are always solutions. And now I'm going to turn things over to Ola. Yeah, and then uh, we're getting into the, the benthic invertebrates that I'm working with. Uh, I'm working at the Stockholm University with monitoring today in uh, the Baltic Sea. Did we include a map of the Baltic? Uh, uh, this, these are just some examples. I'm going to skip them. So uh, why are we looking at the macro? How are we doing on time? Uh, the, some, some reasons why benthic macroinvertebrates, those are the animals that live uh, um, in or on the uh, bottoms of the oceans or seas or lakes, uh, it, is that they're stationary. They represent local conditions. So you, you, you're not it's not confounded, for example, if you have an event with oxygen depletion in, the, in an area, fish would, would avoid it and could come back. So it would be difficult to, to use them as sentinels for oxygen depletion. Uh, um, the benthic macroinvertebrates are also representing several trophic levels and, and organ, organism groups. Uh, um, giving a spread on, on uh, what kind of effects that would um, uh, they, they are uh, I mean the word we can see yeah well, um, they, they, they differ in sensitivity to, to pollution and, and that is also related to them being on different topic levels so um, we would expect, if we have some kind of disturbance, we would expect a change in community composition. Um, you can look at only the community composition as in, in uh, number of taxa, um, the, the abundance of certain species within the community. Uh, but in my case, we often look at this difference in sensitivity and we have attributed different species or, or taxa with different sensitivity values, uh, saying that, for example, oligochaetes, they're very resistant and, and survive almost anything, while we have uh, uh, caddis fly larva and, and uh, other insect larva that are sensitive. Uh, um, but back to the Baltic Sea, uh, which is a kind of unique uh, area with brackish water. It's the big inland brackish water almost because it's so, um, there's very little uh, exchange with, with the Atlantic. 
uh, we have lots of, of uh, fresh water coming in from different countries. We have a big, big uh, catchment area and they're from different states. Uh, so the monitoring we are doing uh, at Stockholm University is um, mostly for nutrient loading, uh, eutrophication. That I would say is the biggest problem today for the Baltic Sea. Uh, uh, the animals are already stressed by um, either being freshwater species that live in the brackish water or saltwater species that live in the brackish water. So this underlying stress makes them very sensitive to other stressors. And in one, one the most important thing being oxygen depletion due to eutrophication. Um, so every year we go into the field and sample sediment with a grab and that we sieve and then I spend the winters sifting through the gravel and residue to see what animals I find and to boil this down to make it accessible for politicians and other management people, we use an index. And I'm not going into it more than to say it's the Bentic Quality Index. And it basically, we use this fact that we attribute different sensitivities to different species. So it takes into account the number of species, the the proportion of sensitive species to the proportion of not so sensitive species and it gives us a number just just a figure that that the politicians can relate um, and that's what they want they don't want the discussion behind it and what could be the reason they, they want a, a scale where, where they can say this is where we are now this is where we want to go uh, and suddenly uh, I jumped. Uh, so let's stay with this and, and just conclude that one, one of the things that we have seen in this monitoring, monitoring program that in some parts have been ongoing since the 1920s uh, uh, is that somewhere around 2000-2001 we, we could see a change in the coastal areas where we have problems with, with the nutrients uh, loading, where it turned to the better. Something in our management of the, the farms um, fertilizer you use or how they spread it uh, changed over the years and, and also our sewage plants got better and that is something we can see in our figures that it, it is getting better in the coastal zone. We can see it in other parts, not all parts of, of the Baltic Sea, uh, but where it's deeper, we have total anoxic zones. There's no oxygen whatsoever and everything is dead. Uh, and those areas are sadly to say they're spreading, but at, at least we, we can we have proof that something went right in in our um, coastal areas even though it might be a bit late another thing uh, that we also find during those uh, monitoring programs is invasive species we um, found in 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 the big end of the 80s uh, a polychaete, a worm uh, that came from America, started to appear in some samples. And 20 years later, we had them in all our samples and up to 4,000 individuals per square meter. It's a very successful invasion. <laughs> and uh, luckily, we haven't seen any negative impacts. Uh, but still, it's, it's important to monitor those things because it have led in part to uh, new rules for shipbuilding uh, in order to avoid 
negative impacts from invasive species. I think all new ships that are built will be required to incorporate some kind of means to um, kill off or, or, or strain out uh, invasive species before releasing their ballast water. Uh, so that's a good thing. And then we're going to jump to the tropics. And this is my old master's thesis um, in Costa Rica. Uh, uh, Costa Rica is a major bana banana exporter, and they are probably the, you have the most intensive pest use in the world, probably, with 44 kilos of pesticides per, per hectare and year. Uh, almost once every week, they fly over the, the plantations and, and spray fungicides. And this causes problems because of uh, banana farms need to be drained. So there's a, an abundance of drainage canals within the farms. And this combined with high precipitation makes all of, of these chemicals, the pesticides, fertilizers and other stuff go into the, the streams and the rivers where the canals drain. Um, there are ob obviously differences in, in management regimes. And uh, on the left picture, there's a small scale organic farm where basically they just pick the bananas where they grow. And then we have a large scale uh, industrial scale farm where they try to kill off everything on the ground, not to have it to compete with the banana plants. Uh, they, as I said, spread spray heavily for fungicides. They uh, use nematicides that they spread on the soil, killing most of the animal life. But uh, even the, the big companies uh, are aware that they need to clean up their act. And they, they do propose some mitigation strategies. strategies. Uh, um, I'll give you some pictures of some of those strategies and, and um, um, yeah. This, this is a sediment trap. Most of, of the um, pesticides have a tendency to attach to sediment particles. So by trapping some of the sediments that otherwise would run off and, and just um, cause sedimentation in, in the rivers, you can retain some of, of the pesticides. Another thing that they try to implement is planting big leaf plants in the canals, because when they fly over, and spray the fungicides. Some of the fungicides are intercepted by the leaves and not entering directly into the streams, and, and thereby by reducing the, at least the, the speed with its release into the rivers, and maybe dampening the, the peaks of, of concentrations. Um, those were some of the, the proposed improvements that, for example, is part of, of the Rainforest Alliance certification. We wanted to check whether it actually made any difference. And um, my study focused on the benthic invertebrates, which I sampled with a net and then pick through and check the community composition again. With the same um, uh, idea that different species have different sensitivities to disturbance. Uh, I'm 100% sure that the EPA of Nebraska have a similar program for monitoring rivers um, and water courses by using benthic invertebrates in the same way. Um, 
this is maybe not a very nice looking picture uh, and, and it kind of highlights the problems of working in the field. This is actually my proposed reference site. This were, it was where I planned back in Sweden to go to, to get the clean samples. It's in the national park, but it, it's, it's uh, affected by a volcano, so there's lots of sulfur in the water, and there, there was absolutely no animals at all alive in, in this stream, making it difficult to, <laughs> to evaluate um, things. But yeah, I already went through this. We were uh, so picking out the, the animals, sorting them, and, and then we spent months uh, identifying them. Uh, we, this is also part of, of another study where we use terrestrial insects and actively compare uh, Rainforest Alliance certified farms with non-certified farms. Coming to the conclusion that it doesn't make any difference at all. Partly because of the non-certified farms also want to clean up their act and they try hard. It, it's sad that we couldn't show any positive effect. Uh, that would have been encouraging, I think. I still think certifications are important. For the way I see it, it, it sends my message to the producers that I'm willing to pay more for something that I, I perceive as better, more sustainably produced. And later on, we will have to add pressure on, on them to, to live up to that uh, claim. Um, but I, I think I'll stop with that. Great. And I think that the certification is a really important issue. Um, so just before we continue, that Another example, I think an example of a, of a working, of an effective certification is um, Smithsonian Institution has a program called Bird Friendly Coffee, where it's a very difficult to get, expensive to get certification, but farmers um, in Latin America, because coffee is a huge uh, tropical agriculture product, um, and it also, just like uh, the chocolate uh, cocoa farming in West Africa causes drives, it's a major driver of deforestation because you can cut down a rainforest and, uh, and plant coffee and make a lot of money potentially. So they have a program to encourage farmers to, um, to maintain a certain amount of forest and especially a certain amount of forest canopy because both coffee and, and cocoa are understory trees actually so you can um, grow it and and maintain a forest canopy and actually still have a lot of bird species but conventional coffee is a complete desert you it's very very few birds that can survive in there but they have um it's difficult for the farmers to get to get uh, the certification without some kind of financial assistance i think because they have to do all these different things but there are i think that's a great yeah the rainforest alliance certification is a great example there are many many other certifications and i think it's a reminder of the importance to actually look at what are they measuring what are they delivering um, because it's a great concept but i think it, yeah we we all have to play a part in kind of making sure the concept works in in real life i think so and now uh, we'll turn to our last uh, case study, which is going to be right back here in Nebraska. And we want to look at the sustainability of land management under advancing climate change. And this is a photograph of the Crane Trust, where um, I'll be talking about now, and our wonderful Platte River that is so important for uh, wildlife and biodiversity. So. This, okay, there we go. <laughs> that slide, the computer really likes that slide. Okay, but now we're, um, so there's been a lot of research recently that's basically using climate modeling to try to predict what will happen in the coming decades. Um, we know there's a lot of, you know, in, in politics and in the news, there's a lot of talk about climate change, um, if it's happening, if it's not happening. I think as far as the birds are concerned, um, they're not uh, political, they don't vote, uh, but they are already responding um, they are to um, the effects of uh, rising temperatures and changing uh, climate conditions. Many of them are um, spending the winter further north. Many of them are coming um, 
uh, advancing their migration dates. That's certainly true of the Sandhill cranes um, that, um, that come here every year that are here right now. Um, and the recent uh, scientists at the Audubon Society um, published a study several years ago and uh, found that over half of North American bird species are, uh, are expected to be negatively impacted by um, climate change already now, but also um, in the future. Um, in Europe, which is further north than the United States, um, they have already been um, addressing this through long-term studies. And the subject of uh, many of these studies is the bird pictured here called the pied flycatcher. And um, this is uh, kind of a special case because it was the first, the first study case where scientists could see this bird has been arriving earlier on the breeding grounds, I think for several decades now. Um, and there is a mismatch between its arrival time and when, um, when the caterpillars now emerge, and that's critical for the birds because that's their main food source. And when they have chicks, they want to time the hatching of their chicks at the time of peak caterpillar emergence because that way they can give their chicks as much food as they can. Um, and now that they, they are arriving as soon as they can, but it's not soon enough to, to, mat, to meet that peak in caterpillar abundance. And so in many areas of Europe, their populations have crashed. And so that got a lot of attention just because it's a warning sign of what could happen uh, with other birds. Um, in North America, um, uh, there have been this study that I'm showing um, in ecography just came out in the last few weeks. It, there are more, many more questions than answers. How will climate change affect especially migratory birds that have this extremely complicated lifestyle? They're moving all over the world. They use different cues um, to know when to migrate. Scientists don't really have a good understanding of when and why they move in many cases. Um, and there's really no historical precedent as far as scientists are concerned for what we're going to see in the coming decades. Um, but yet birds will have to respond. Um, and so what we're doing at the Crane Trust, we have, um, we are participating in a nationwide program that's um, called MAPS for short. Um, it stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. It's a program that operates um, all over the United States. Um, it's been operating for decades. And so it's a wonderful source of long-term data on birds uh, populations. And these are some photographs from the last few years of the Crane Trust of operating this program. Um, and uh, in the right hand, lower right hand corner is our um, sentinel species. In this case, we're just going to look at one species, not an entire bird community. We are looking at the bird community, but right now uh, we're going to focus on this one. It's called the grasshopper sparrow, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. And um, I just want to give a shout out. The, the person uh, in the blue t-shirt with the hat is Alex Glass, and he's done a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes. Um, but first, the grasshopper sparrow. Um, it's, a, um, it's a beautiful and very um, humble bird that is <laughs> not famous like the like the whooping cranes, like the sandhill cranes. Um, it's a little bit hard to see. Um, nonetheless, it's a very important uh, grassland sentinel species. And as you can see, this area um, in the map is, is where its population, breeding populations are at the highest density. This is sort of a stronghold for them. They have lost, they and many other grassland birds in North America are, have uh, dealt with significant population declines. They've declined almost 70% um, in the last several decades. And most of that is believed to be because of habitat loss, because when they're habit they're, they breed in grasslands, when those grasslands are converted to agriculture, they are completely useless um, for the grasshopper sparrow. They are gone. Um, and so places like the crane trust where we actually maintain native habitat are extremely important for them. Um, so this is a map just showing where we are in Nebraska on the Platte River. Um, and then just taking through the details of the study, I'm just going to lay them out <laughs> first. Um, we use banding data for this. So we started this program, the MAPS program in 2002. Um, it operated until 2012, uh, 2007. And then we, we began the study again in 2017. And we're now in ongoing data collection. And the idea is to have five years of data on both ends and we can compare it over a longer period because for climate data in particular, you need long, you need longer term data to really show what the trends are because they're small effects and big effects. Um, so we need lots of data to study that. Uh, we not only studied um, climate, uh, the climate parameters with um, these populations, but also land management um, actions. Um, 
Grasslands are disturbance dependent ecosystems, meaning that unless they have fire, as shown here, or grazing um, uh, in the past by American bison and, and currently by cattle, and we've also recently reintroduced uh, bison to the Crane Trust, um, these, these forces are needed to maintain the grasslands, and many grassland birds respond differently, have different levels of sensitivity. Um, in this case, the grasshopper sparrow prefers um, fairly open environments. They don't like a lot of thick grass. They like open um, uh, uh, vegetation. It's better for their foraging. They, they forage on the ground. They're moving around on the ground, so they don't like a lot of vegetation in their way. So they, um, they respond positively to both uh, burning and grazing of grasslands. Um, we basically looked at, uh, again, I'm not going to go into all of the, the data. Um, if people are interested, we can ask, but I'm just going to show you what we found so far with this one species, and we're looking at all of all of our species, in particular ones that are of conservation concern like this species. Um, in general, we can expect with climate change in the Great Plains in the coming decades, more frequent droughts and more extreme precipitation. We found when looking at the NOAA data, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration data that's been uh, that's online, it's free to everyone, and um, where we can go back in time and look at um, what has happened when, and then we when we compare that to the bird population changes over time, we found that spring precipitation is the strongest predictor of of sparrow abundance, and that the interaction of spring precipitation and temperature is the strongest predictor of productivity. By productivity, we mean, we mean offspring, because they need, um, for population dynamics, you need not only to survive, but you need to produce offspring. So we found these have strong effects on grasshopper sparrows, um, and that grazing and burning mitigate the effects of these uh, factors. Um, they actually respond negatively to rainfall. When there's a lot of rain, uh, there's more vegetation growth, and grasshopper sparrows actually don't do well with a lot of vegetation growth uh, for various, it may be behavioral, it may be food resources. We don't actually know the mechanism. We just know that that's the case. Um, so what it tells us, the good news, I think, about the potential bad news of climate change uh, impending impacts on grasshopper sparrow is that we can actually manage to mitigate these impacts um, when we are making sure to graze and burn uh, these landscapes on a regular basis, we know that will benefit the grasshopper sparrow. And what we do, what anyone does on conservation land in the Great Plains for this bird is going to be really important for their future populations. So it gives us some clues about how we can manage land sustainably for this species. And it, it's a little bit different for every species. Um, so this is just a start, I guess. Uh, question? Do you mind questions? No, no, go, go for it because we're coming. Yeah, we're coming. I'm wondering about Mm -hmm. Do the cutters farm? Okay, so you keep the grass down, but do the cutter farms injure the nests and birds? Yeah, that's a great. That, that's a great. We're actually doing a study. Yes, they do. Um, we have our our control site in this case. Um, well, we we have a whole. We have a number of sites. I can actually go back. That'll let me. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we had we have sites that include haying. We uh, did not find strong effects of haying. Um, however, we never hay during the bird breeding season. I think that's the thing. And we're actually working with University of Nebraska Lincoln now on a study that Mary's also contributed to um, to look at the effects of, of haying and specifically whether farmers will be willing to change their haying timing to, to avoid destroying nests. Um, th there's a project um, in, the, in New England, I think the, some of the Atlantic states called the Bobbling Project, where they actually, it's a private um, conservation effort where they raise funds and they get donor funding to pay farmers to, to change to not hay during the breeding season because they can make it for any lost income from the farmer's perspective because from the farmer's perspective you want to hay when the nutritional quality of the hay is highest and often that is during the bird breeding season. So to save the birds you ha you're asking them to lose some money and so if you compensate them for some of them that can work. Not, not everyone's willing to do that, but a lot of people are. And so they've gotten that to work in New England and the East, but no one's ever investigated if that could work here in the Great Plains. So we've, we're have we doing a study now in Nebraska, so hopefully we'll have some good news about that. Where, um, where will that paper be published? We have, we're, we're in data collection uh, now. So uh, 
we're, we're op I think we're open to suggestions. I think one of the human dimensions of journals or ecology and society or some, hopefully is an open access journal so that everybody, and, and we'll, we can put it on the Chrome Trust website and yeah, we'll, we can hopefully have like a, a blog post and a press release about that. Um, but the, it'll, it'll probably be, yeah, we're, we're still collecting data right now. So then we'll need to analyze it and go forth. So, um, Actually, yeah, we were just at the at the end. I just wanted to acknowledge that a lot of other people contributed to the, the work I did in Ghana was um, funded by the Zoological Society of London. Um, the Crane Trust has made it possible for us to be here. We partner with the Institute of Bird Populations and um, Alex Glass, whom I mentioned, um, is now a PhD student at the um, at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And so we're continuing to collaborate on this on this study and um, we can take any questions. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so we can go ahead and start in person and then we'll give the um, online folks a chance to type theirs into the chat box. So yeah, there's a big delay on my end for you guys that are there in person. So sorry if I interrupted something, but go ahead. Oh, uh, Rainforest Certification Apocalypse. For Rainforest Alliance, you mean? And Nico, could you repeat the questions um, from in person? Because we can't hear the audience when they're talking. Sure. Sorry. So this is a question from Dr. Bill Beachley about uh, rainforest, about um, certified cocoa, certified chocolate. Yeah. Or actually, sorry, I'm going to ask him to repeat it so just so that I make sure I get it right. That program, unfortunately, was not there. There was a bit of talk about that. But I'm not aware of any op, any currently operating program in Ghana to that. And in, in fact, unfortunately, everything was going in the opposite direction. Where in the past, um, there they grew cocoa under a rain, cocoa trees under a rainforest canopy, and now there are all these hybrids that make it possible because then the, the natural tree will not grow in full sun. But now they've produced all these hybrids that make for farmers to grow trees faster and they cut down all the trees and that is what I was seeing happen in Ghana there was no we, there were yeah I mean there was some kind of wishful thinking on the part of some of us um, conservation scientists you know I'm not aware of any such program existing in anywhere in West Africa actually I'm aware of some do you know where the, the what the source of in some South America and Central America yeah for for whatever reason they're way ahead when it comes to that sort of thing at least when it and trying, but you see very, I saw literally nothing of that, I'm sorry to say, in, in West Africa. I know there was some organic farming in certain areas, but wonderful to do something like bird-friendly cocoa, I think would be an, uh, just an absolutely wonderful goal. And I'm not aware of anyone, some scientists at Smithsonian, Russ Green at Smithsonian, who did a lot of work on that with coffee and some work on that with cocoa, but um, unfortunately, he's passed away, and I'm not aware of anyone that's really pushing it forward with this, with that kind of um, So I, it's something I'd love to see happen. I'm not aware of it happening in West Africa. No, I don't know. We do have an online question. Um, so this question is, I've been under the impression that the common sparrow is invasive in the U.S. and pose competition with native birds. Do grassland sparrows differ in that aspect? Are is the are you talking about the English sparrow, the house sparrow? Is that what? The, is that not what they're? I'm sorry. What was that? You just got really quiet. Okay. Yes. Yeah, um, that's okay. Uh, the question I understood was about the common sparrow, and I'm I'm guessing we are guessing that that that. that is referring to the house sparrow and the house sparrow is a, it's yes. an introduced bird from England. Yes. OK, so that is a European bird. I think it's declining in Europe. It's not doing uh, great in, in Europe, but it is introduced and invasive, considered invasive in the United in the United States. Um, they, they yes, they do have now on native birds. I don't think I mean, they're not normally predators that the most dramatic we see from invasive species in among vertebrates are predators, um, American mink and, and 
and then their European um, rats, uh, cats can have, um, but bird, birds can have large impacts and they, 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 can, they can displace other birds from nest boxes. That's one big impact that house sparrows can have because they use nest sparrows and, uh, sorry, nest boxes and they can, they're, they're, they can be very aggressive compared to native birds. Um, so the, yeah, they're not, they're, there are not so many studies I'm aware of on, in part because on their Im ecological impacts, I think in part because they, they tend to be restricted to urban areas. In, in places that are very unfriendly to native birds in many other respects. So it's difficult to sort of isolate what, what their impacts are. Um, I've been, I'm have been i involved in another project looking at um, invasive birds. This is on tropical islands, but and their impacts on native bird communities. And found there's a high correlation between the presence of the invasive bird and urbanization with all of these other things that impact wildlife. And so it's it's difficult to sort of if you if you take the urbanization out of the picture, it's difficult to say what usually competition. But yeah, I they're definitely not good for native birds and it's and it's also difficult to remove them or control them when they're um when they're in a when they're in an ecosystem when they're successful. Oh, and Great, I hope you. that if that didn't answer the question, please ask something. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that did or not. So. Awesome. Um, we have another question. Uh, so you mentioned certifications. Um, how can consumers be aware of how beneficial or not uh, certain certifications are to the environment? So like the Forest, Forest Stewardship Council certification, um, are there negative impacts from that? My understanding, so there's a lot of controversy about certification. Unfortunately, and I, I'm going to ask Ola to, to speak to this in a minute, but I, I get the forest, um, uh, yeah, the Forest Stewardship Council certification. Unfortunately, I feel a little bad saying this, but unfortunately, I have not heard many positive things. I, I personally have not looked into this as a researcher um, at all. There, were, there were no certified forests in Ghana, for example, where I've done a lot of research. It, it wasn't, they didn't exist, so, so there was no way to look at them. Um, I have been told by scientists that there are, by other scientists who have worked directly with that, with that certification, um, that there is a social value, and I've heard this about other, about Rainforest Alliance certifications as well. Um, there tends to be a social value. You're, you're helping the, the kind of the, the little guys, the, the farmers, the um, Kind of local loggers and so forth and it and it because they get a better price but in terms of deliverables in terms of biodiversity um there often may not be a difference that's that's what i have been told again i, I can't tell you studies and i haven't studied this myself but um in terms of uh, we need i think the best thing consumers can do uh, personally as far as this goes is be is just kind of hold hold certifiers feet to the fire in terms of saying what does this actually deliver because when you look at the fine print Sometimes it's just not there, or the marketing is very different than what the actual um, what the actual outcomes are. And I think that that was that was what I found in studying logging in Ghana. When you look on paper, it all looks good. Um, they're signed up for all these voluntary agreements where they're um, participating in um, you know sustainable logging. But when you actually look, okay, okay, if this is sustainable, let's look at what's happening on the ground. Let's look at the animal communities. As going back to let's measure it. Um, when you measure it, you don't, what you find is not encouraging. Um, and I, I think that, again, I think it goes back to the importance of, of evaluating um, these kinds of efforts. And there's a, I recommend if folks are interested, the um, environmental economist who does really excellent work on evaluating conservation effectiveness. Um, he use, he's, an, yeah, um, an economist, so he uses um, different statistical methods than biologists often do. But basically, he he kind of asked a hypothetical. What if you? He's done projects with the Endangered Species Act. What if this species? What if this species wasn't considered endangered? Would that make a difference? He actually did a study of American uh, American species protected under the Endangered Species Act and asked, what if they had or had not been protected? Would it make a difference? Did it actually help them to be protected? He found in uh, in some of his work um, that they. Actually, without it, only made a difference with substantial federal funding. Um, without the funding, it was actually counterproductive to be listed as as endangered because people don't want it on their land 
because once a species is endangered, um, the federal government has all these rules about you can't cut the trees, you can't do this, you can't do that. And so people would actually, it's called shoot, shovel, and shut up. People will go out and just get rid of it before anybody knows it's there. And so it's actually, it actually works against it. When people can get compensated and there's funding to protect the species, then it has an effect. But so to me, that was surprising. You know, a lot of us would think, oh yeah, it's protected, everything's fine. Well, not necessarily. And they've done studies in Costa Rica looking at protected areas. Does does a, does an area being protected actually help it? I mean, in, in Ghana, it doesn't, um, being, being protected doesn't stop, doesn't keep out hunters, doesn't keep out illegal loggers. It can stop blanket um, deforestation. But it, there's a lot of things that doesn't stop. So I, I think um, I think as consumers, by asking questions and even you know, contacting companies and saying, you know, I really like your product, but I really want to make sure that it's responsible, and and just kind of doing doing our research, I think that that's a good way that we can go about it. I, I want to see if Ola has something to say. Yeah, and I, I don't have much to comment on that. More than I I think there is hopefully often a good intent. Uh, from the, the companies, as as we could see with the banana farm companies, uh, uh, they're often subcontracted. But but uh, the intent is good, but there's no one measuring if it does any real difference, and, and that's what have to be done. Yeah, and it and in many cases it doesn't. It's not. It's not so hard. Do it just takes a little bit of political will, of money. In, in many cases, I've talked about this with a lot of scientists. Even you know, another example is oil spills. You know, when the when the public sees pictures of oiled birds after an oil spill, everybody's very upset, and people want to know that there's something happens. They've a lot of the kind of public relations. They'll show you know cleaning birds and things like that. But in many cases, I was talking to someone who's worked on this. They don't actually know if those birds survive in the end because they don't evaluate. They don't tag them. They don't. And so I think it's the importance of actually finding ways. And there, there's more interest in this lately um, of actually measuring the outcome. And there's way too little of this work, but hopefully we'll see more and more of it in the future. But I, I think it's a, also a shout out to anyone who's um, listening at professors, students, um, professionals of any, this, this, this this is an area that really needs contribution. Um, and it's it's a lot of, and yeah, it's not so difficult to do. You just need um, you, you to kind of design a study and do it. And it, it's really, um, I was kind of amazed in, in Ghana that no one had ever done this before because it's kind of show up and it, you can you can do some of these studies in a very short amount of time. I mean, you, if you have a longer time, if you have more funding, that's great. But again, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be, it's not rocket science. It should be done, kind of, in my opinion, almost all the time with these, at least enough so that we know what we're getting when we pay for a certification or and it's it's also not to say that like oh none of the stuff it's all the same it's not like the organic label i think that you know that's a usda organic or they're there I mean, if it's a federal government certification i think it means something i think i think what you want who who gave the certification who are they you know and um and what are their rules and it's um but i mean I, those things all the time personally because I just want to be the most responsible consumer I can be and if and sometimes if I don't know about something I'm just saying to do with it so I think the more I do that we're the ones in the end that are gonna decide what happens you know it's it's on the ground that's that's how we make a difference if the more of us that decide we're interested in this even just with you know one kind of product or whatever the more we can make a difference um and the more we communicate that that is said to um to yeah, to politicians and to um, people marketing things like this, the more people will get the mass. Point there's a critical mass, and people say, okay, maybe we should, we should do more. We should be more responsible, more sustainable. So, sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> no, that was great. I think that was really helpful um, and really information or informative on you know how we can be better consumers. Um, but I think that is all the questions we have. Um, so the presentation today was recorded, so it'll be up on our website in about one to two weeks. Um, where you, and you can also find all of our past presentations there. So that's cccneb.edu slash SLPS. Uh, so our next presentation will be Thursday, April 4th, and it'll be hosted by Metropolitan Community College. So thank you both um, so much for that presentation. Um, I think that really gives everybody a good idea of you know, the importance of ecosystems and how animals are affected. Uh, and thank you, all of our viewers, for attending today.
Have a great yeah, thank day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.